really different for every project, but for this one, um, it was very kind of open-ended because they're three, essentially three monologues. So there's no locating sort of place that the play takes place. There's no kind of naturalism to, you know, you're recreating a specific room of a house or anything like that. So you've kind of got a complete open-ended freedom when you get a script like that. But it can also be daunting to have something that open-ended. So you've got to kind of narrow down what are the things you want to achieve with the director. So first of all, kind of talk about how do we want these to be presented, these monologues, and what is the relationship between the three monologues is really important. So, you know, do we create a world in which the actors within the monologues are very isolated, or do you create overlapping worlds where they can sort of move through each other? And that kind of helps to find the space. One thing Natalie was really clear about at the beginning was that she wanted it to be really physical. So she definitely didn't want to have, uh, you know, three people standing in space delivering their monologues. She wanted to see, you know, girls, young women being very active and playing against that stereotype of girls, you know, just sort of sitting quietly and being pretty and, you know, seeing them being really active and physical and doing things that, you know, the characters talk about, you know, people assuming that's what the boys do and these girls were all very strong and there's one who's particularly interested in sports so we wanted to reflect that physicality we wanted to see girls being messy and getting sweaty and so we needed to create a kind of landscape where they could do that and not just kind of something that held them in space so that was kind of the starting point the key thing with a show like this where it's very physical um, is always to get the set into rehearsals as quickly as possible. So we were lucky enough to have that. Um, it would sort of be kind of impossible to rehearse it if you were just marking the things and not actually doing them. So they kind of rehearsed it up to a point where they could in terms of character work and then they needed to start working the physical action. So the set was in rehearsals, so that was really helpful. You always in a rehearsal space have the set marked out on the floor in tape anyway, so that people know what the parameters are. But very often people get a stand-in for if you have heights or levels or anything like that, you'll need that. There are lots of reveals in terms of their costumes. So we've, rather than have the set reveal things, we've made it more about the girls actively creating the reveals themselves, which came out of rehearsals. So it did mean that in terms of costume, we had a kind of concept of what the costume would be. And then that very quickly changed and evolved into something very different because they had to accommodate all these reveals. So it's, you know, uh, rehearsals are always a learning process and directors will always ask for, you know, lots of things that weren't originally there and you just, you try and adapt and work around it and, you know, they'll find out things in rehearsals that ultimately enhance the show, but you can never have pre-directed a whole show before you get into rehearsals. you've got a period piece or something you know and you know it's set in 1890 in a big country house you can research that particular thing with this because it's open-ended and kind of abstract it's not so much researching a topic or a specific thing but you certainly always usually start a creative process by collecting images and kind of sharing images back and forth with the director seeing what appeals to them Natalie was showing me sort of videos of movement. Um, that was kind of her main starting point. And she was sort of showing sets that moved and rotated and enabled the actors to always be kind of in motion. Um, and so that was kind of her language. And then I was thinking about um, from that kind of loops, things that could create endless kind of um, cycles of action. So looking at kind of running tracks looking at um, sort of BMXing tracks that have loops, thinking about, you know, things that young people interact with that allow them to be physical, so kind of playgrounds. You know, it is sort of centred around their school life, so it was sort of useful to look at imagery of schools and playgrounds and activity spaces, um, although we didn't recreate a sort of naturalistic playground. What we've ended up with is something definitely influenced by playgrounds that gives opportunities for different levels, different speeds, different kind of types of movement from jumping to hanging and swinging and climbing. 
So that's kind of what we, what we started looking at. When you do a touring show, the first thing you do before you design anything is you put all the sizes of all the different venues on a plan. Um, and you always create a kind of template for the smallest space and template for the biggest space. And you try and make it as consistent as possible because the stage management team have to, um, you know, construct it every time and they don't want to have, you know, 12 different versions of the set to put up. So you generally try and create a sort of standard size and then if you have to, like a smaller version and a larger version. And with this, we created two sizes. So we've got the standard version and then a slightly compressed version. Most of the spaces are fairly similar in scale. So the set has to sort of compress. So we've got a series of kind of structures that are kind of climbing frames and they usually sit sort of separate. And then there's one venue where they sort of lock behind each other. So you've got to try and minimize the re-blocking because there's not a director or a movement director on tour. In the venue where it gets smaller, the associate director is going out, so she will be there to re make sure the re-blocking is there, but it's it's always a big consideration on tour that you, you want to not have too many changes because it, it has a big knock-on effect. So when you rehearse a show, you do what is called blocking, which is basically the actors learning where to stand and when. For example, an actor would know when I deliver this line, I'm standing on this particular part of the set. Um, if that particular part of the set isn't there anymore because the set has shrunk in size, that blocking needs to be re-blocked. So you have to move them to another place. So it's kind of thinking, I think it comes from thinking about people in space as blocks that you move around the board um, and you know that you have to change where those blocks sit if the space changes. Yeah, and then with the shapes and the spaces itself, I think curves felt right. I think they were really fluid and it felt very interesting in this kind of figure of eight shape, the idea of kind of continual looping and the kind of um, way in which the girls kind of follow each other but also lead at different times. And so we have a series of kind of curves, circles, and they're all kind of cut out and the shapes are reiterated all across the space. With the climbing frames, we've sort of used the voids in the climbing frames at the back, so we're trying to kind of reuse the shapes so it kind of becomes echoes of the, the shapes across the set. When you're designing, you shouldn't limit your ideas or creativity based on uh, thinking about the environment, because you could tie yourself up in knots and not allow yourself to find the right solution for the play. So whilst it's really important, I think the first thing to do is just think about what the play needs um, and go start with that. And then once you've established your idea and sort of got your design, then the next step is to think about how to achieve that in a sustainable way. You know, it is really hard because by the nature shows have short runs often. So the question is always what is the set made of and what happens to it afterwards. And certainly when I started out and you don't have any money for shows, I got every single piece of wood for the shows off, you know, FreeCycle and eBay and, you know, Facebook and things like that. So still use a company called Scenery Salvage quite a lot. So they're a big scenery warehouse. So for example, a lot of theatres, I know in the National Theatre certainly do send every single one of their sets to Scenery Salvage. So that means they take it apart and they, you know, every window, every door, every everything, they keep it. So they have a, you know, a massive sort of aircraft hangar full of windows, doors, kitchen elements, you know, lighting, furnishings. So in theory, there's not really any need for anything to be thrown away in theatre. So I think that's one of the most important things is when you're done with the set, what happens to it? Um, and if it is made of plastic, something is made of plastic, it's not necessarily the end of the world because plastic is very durable and if that plastic item goes on you know for another 20 years and is in however many you know other shows then it has served a purpose they've thought really hard on this show about transport and the emissions and so they've tried to source everything from locally within newcastle and if they can't then they've tried to get it as close as possible 
and you know you're, the things you're trying to avoid is going further and further away and getting something that's been shipped from China basically. There's also a lot of parts of the set if you stand behind the set you can see it's made of old things so it's on the reverse of the painted sides is old bits of old sets so you can see that they haven't bought new wood they've just taken old things chopped them up made them into different shapes. In terms of the floor the floor is a dance floor which is plastic but it's a dance floor that was already owned by Fuel Theatre and they've taken it and just repainted it and repurposed it. So there's a kind of loop in theatre that can keep going and there's not really any reason that anything should be skipped at the end. You know it's, it's a tricky thing and with costume you're always trying to say what well, can we get it from a costume store first of all. If it can't come from a costume store can you buy it second hand? And often with theatre, what it comes down to is time. And you can try really hard to get everything in advance, but ultimately you'll get to just before the show and you'll do a costume fitting and something won't be right and you need something else. And you have to buy it new. And you probably have to go to Amazon or something because you need it next day because the show's going to open. You know, these things inevitably happen. But if after the show, you can then put that back into a system and not just be like, oh, well, we don't need this dress anymore you know, if you can either charity shop it or put it back into a costume store, then you're just not creating waste. So I think that's the really important thing is thinking about it, it once it's served its purpose, what does it do? And with a touring show, I said, you know, this show is going to go on a long tour and then it's going to go into storage with the ambition that it can be brought out of storage, you know, every year if it needs to and do more tours and therefore it's not just lasting for four weeks like a normal show. It can go on and on and on. So they've built it in a very sturdy way to make it robust enough to last for several years, you know. So it's all about thinking ahead of the end of the show. Because it's sort of an abstract set, you, you can it can be any colour or it could be no colour at all, you know. So we thought about what is the impact we want it to have when young people see it for the first time. And we were keen that they should be excited by the show, that it should seem vibrant and fun, that it doesn't convey the sense that they're coming to see a very serious abstract piece of theatre, that they will enjoy it, they will laugh, it's playful, um, it's exuberant. You know, there are some very, very serious topics in it, but the overall impression we want people to take away is that it's been a very dynamic, enjoyable, show even in spite of the very serious kind of subject matter. It's undeniable that colours are gendered and so we wanted it to be something that reflected the young women and girls and that had elements of femininity but that wouldn't make you know young men and boys feel excluded or like this is a girls show which is sadly something that exists and you can't sort of ignore it. So we tried different colour palettes. We tried to think about a version where it was all just exposed wood, um, so there was no colour. Uh, we tried sort of darker, slightly more sombre colour palettes. We tried super bright poppy colour palettes. Um, and we yeah, asked a range of kind of eight, nine-year-olds, I think some 11 and 12-year-olds were asked as well what they thought, um, and just fed back about, we didn't tell them what the show was about, but we asked them without knowing anything about the play, does it look like the kind of show you'd like to see? So that was kind of our research. Does it appeal or does it alienate you? And we kind of found that they were a lot more responsive to it. Not many of them had sort of gendered responses to it, but we kind of went for a palette that's very bright, very poppy, very fun. We want, you know, these like girls to feel like they are, you know, energised, exuberant young people. But we also kind of didn't want it to feel too young. So rather than going for kind of the more primary colours that you would go for, maybe uh, if you were decorating a nursery or something, and you know, you, or that you see in very young children's toys, we went for colours that maybe is slightly more going towards what a 9, 10, 11, 12 year old would like to paint their bedroom as they're kind of entering towards their teenage years, you know, so slightly more uh, chalky versions of the colours that feel a bit more refined and a bit less like kind of um, like it's a, a sort of nursery school 
you know, playground setup. We did think about whether the girls were going to be wearing uh, just their regular clothes, but we felt because the play is very focused around school, in the very first moment of the play, where we first meet the characters, they are all just after school. Um, so we felt that it was right that they should be wearing school uniform. We also felt that it helped our actors are slightly older, considerably older than, uh, than you know, they're not 11. Yeah, it just helps to create that sense of someone being younger than they actually are, which is always good because you really need to be able to suspend your disbelief and invest in these characters as being 11-year-old girls. Also, what it helped us do is we didn't want to give away at the very beginning of the play that they're all at the same school because you sort of find that out throughout. So with the uniform, we've gone for a sort of overriding colour theme of green, but we've given them all different versions of the school uniform so that when we realise that they're all at the same school, they make sense as a collection, but we don't look at them to start with and necessarily go, oh, they're all lined up in exactly the same clothes. So it takes us a little while to see that, oh, they are actually all linked and it does make sense. We haven't put any kind of school insignia on the costumes or anything because we didn't want uh, to be that obvious. We didn't want to like make up a school logo. We thought it better just to leave all logos off and just use a kind of color, color theme that ties them together. It's quite a sort of abstract space. Um, I certainly don't think anyone would walk in and think, oh, it's a, you know, this or that. It certainly has echoes of a playground. It's got two large climbing frame structures. One is a sort of S-curve, and one is a big kind of semicircle. The one with the S-curve is designed specifically because there is a character in the play who has a kind of refuge in the woods and a place where she goes when she feels overwhelmed and scared and she goes and sort of hides in this space so we needed to create a small space in which she could be so there's a sort of large part of the s which creates a big arch that they can climb over and then the smaller part which creates this sort of little safe space and then there's a series of podiums as well and there are sort of podiums talked about throughout the play about the idea of kind of winning and champions and you know standing on the winner's podium um, also the idea of podiums is in like standing up and speaking, being an activist and you know there's um, a sort of a big protest at the end you know so we're creating these podiums for them to stand up and speak out and sort of have their voices lifted up and then there's a sort of big running track that flows through the whole thing so they can run around the running track and sort of interact with all the spaces. Yeah I think lighting really helps so Ali has done the lighting it's done an amazing job and really a designer's job is to work always with the lighting designer to create something and particularly when it's sort of kind of abstract then your job is to work with the lighting designer to work out how to bring this abstract space to life so um, she's really cleverly concealed lots of LED light like throughout the space and all the kind of cut out shapes have these LED lighting strips down the side so she can isolate different areas of the set so for example when Chloe's in her bird hide in the woods, the, an LED strip isolates that little section. Similarly, the girls all have their own colour palette, which Ali's created, so we can kind of isolate them in space in their kind of their colour world, and that helps. The podiums can also create little islands that they can be on, and because we've got such different levels and spaces, you can position the actors throughout the space at different heights in different spaces, so while they're all occupying you know, the same space, they can the pictures are very different so i think that's kind of what we've aimed to do with all these different levels i think there's a line in the show where one of the grandmas says and what you what are you going to do now because you can't just be angry or sad about something you have to then say what's next how do we change it and i think that's the question the show asks, is how do we change this? The show kind of conveys to young people that whilst you feel all these feelings, they're all very valid, we all need to do something together about it. We can't just, um, you know, shout about it on social media and think you've done something because you haven't really, you know, you've got to make a stand or like think what's the practical action I can take and how, most importantly, how can I 
have the ripple effect to influence everyone around me. And I think that's what's shown really nicely in the play is the ripple effect of, you know, it can just start with one person. And I think when you're young, you can sometimes feel like you don't have much power. And I think all these girls at different points in the play feel like you don't have much power. But um, when you start having a knock-on effect on the people around you, then you can make big change because you are just one person. But if you tell five people and they tell five people and they tell five people, then you've had a huge effect. <laughs> <laughs>